We are back with the Night of Unhallowed Words. I have in studio with me Rose Schaffer, as I pronounce it. I hope so. With her work, Bloody Countess. Hi. Hi thanks, there. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So what are you going to read? What do you have in store for so us? So I have a selection from the work that I have been um, working on for the past couple of years. It is inspired by the true life events of Elizabeth Bathory, who is commonly known as the Blood Countess. And this, what I'm about to read is a, it's a very short piece. It's a very, it's, it's really just like a taste of what the whole book is going to be. The whole book is going to be very complicated. It's taking me a lot of time to write. It's taking me a lot of time to research, but I want to get people excited about it. So I, I want to start sharing the, the bits that I'm proud of with people. Okay. Yeah. So whenever you are ready, you okay. can dive right into it. For days after the funeral, I was little more than a ghost. I drifted through the halls of Shavar, my heart empty, my body tired. I could not bear the reality of my situation. He was gone. My pharynx, my sword and shield, I was utterly alone. They came quickly, the creditors, the priests, the nobles. They all had something to say, something to ask for. I let the stewards handle most of it, putting what little energy I had instead to ignoring their pitying looks, their nervous glances. For a while, I wondered if this was to be my final fate, abandoned of all emotion like a sea-wrecked ship on a desolate shore. Until one night, some days later, I was sending Paul off to bed. He had clung to me all the harder since Farring's passing, and now he would not even go to sleep without me putting him in bed myself. I was sitting on the edge of his bed, idly smoothing the blankets around his tiny frame, when I realized he was staring at me with an expression I'd never seen on him before. I opened my mouth to say goodnight when suddenly he grabbed my hand. You won't be sad forever, will you, mother? His eyes were so pleading, his voice was trembling. For a moment, I was speechless. I realized my child was terrified. Already he had lost one parent, and here the only one he had was slipping away into oblivion. He needed me, and I was failing him. No, said a voice within me. I will not let that happen. I pulled my shoulders back and forced away the haze of grief until my mind was once more sharp and clear. I took both his hands in my own and looked squarely back at him. No, pal, I will not be sad forever. I put a strength in my voice that I did not feel and spoke on. Your father was a great man, I began, and I struggled to find the right words. Farrenk was so much more than that. He was a soldier, a leader, a savage, a terror. But Paul saw him only as a father, a hero. I would do nothing to corrupt that image. We shall all miss him terribly, but we are strong. We are batteries, yes? We are warriors. He nodded and smiled a little, and I could see that he believed me. I smiled, even as my own words echoed back through my mind in cruel mockery. I squeezed his hands once more before standing. Everything will be all right, my dear, I promise. I made my way back to my rooms, and with every step my heart broke open at last. I was no warrior. I was a wrinkled husk of a woman drowning in debt with no prospects of marriage to rescue me. Everything I was, everything my family had worked for, it would all be torn away soon. Without a husband, without Farrink, I would have been better off dead. I walked through the corridors blind. I'm sure I passed guards and servants, but even now I cannot recall their faces. Perhaps they looked at me strangely, perhaps they whispered about me once I passed, I'll never know. My purpose was singular, to get away, to hide before I fell apart. I must have been holding my breath somewhat, for I remember desperately gulping back air into my lungs as soon as I heaved the door to my room's shut. I stumbled my way towards the nearest piece of furniture, a large chair beside the fire. My frame had not even fully rested on the plush cushions before several maids rushed to my side. Are you all right, my, my ladyship? Can I get you some tea, my ladyship? It all became too much. The numbness had been a temporary shelter from reality, but that was crumbling fast, and now these twits were flocking around me. Back, all of you, I barked. They all fell silent, and though I did not face them, I could feel them all retreating. They did not leave, though. I had not told them to. 
only crept back to whatever corner of the room they preferred to wait from where they preferred to wait for my next demand. Even so surrounded, I knew the truth. I was alone. Alone and at the mercy of men who would be only too happy to rip me to pieces. And without Farring's good name to cling to, the rumors would catch up to me soon. Panic stabbed at my heart as visions of the future flooded my mind. My name in ruins, my children ripped from me or left destitute. It was too much to bear. My chest grew tight. I could scarcely breathe. I needed to act, to find an anchor, anything to keep me from fall collapsing in on myself. My eyes searched the room and landed on a handmaid who had positioned herself near the edge of the fireplace, working on some piece of sewing by the light of the flames. Though her eyes were focused on her needlework, I was sure she had been watching me, probably reveling in my misery. Before I knew what was happening, I was up and across the room. I ripped the garment from her hands, giving it only a passing glance. And what is this? I hissed. Her eyes filled with terror, and it soothed me like a balm. Now it was she, not I, who was afraid. I, I was merely repairing your slip, my lady, as requested. I slapped her hard with the back of my hand. The jewels from my rings proved more than their worth as thin lines of blood burst forth from her pale cheek. Insolent girl, your work is shoddy. You are unfit for your position. She brought a hand to her mouth as tears dripped from her eyes, mingling with the blood. Just like that, I was no longer drowning. My heart sang at the sight of my impact. I was no longer weak or insignificant. It was she who was these things, and she would do well to be reminded of that fact. Stand, I commanded. I heard movement from the other side of the room. Ladyship? It was Alona. She had appeared as if from nothing, ready and waiting for my word. A rose among weeds, my Ilona. In moments, she had the whimpering seamstress stripped of her clothing and the room emptied of any rem remaining staff before stepping aside to allow my fury room to rain down unobstructed. And rain down it did. Very good. Thank you. That was Rose Schaffer reading Bloody Countess. Mm -hmm. So how did that begin? So, how, oh, how, uh, I year, literally years ago when I was 16, I read a book called The Blood Confessions um, by uh, I wish I could remember the, art, the writer's name. But it was loosely based around this this story about Elizabeth Bathory, who was a real life women, woman, uh, lived in 16th century Hungary. And um, the the way that that book was written, this character who was angry and violent and vain, it just grabbed me and it did not let go for years and years. And for years and years, I tried to figure out a way to tell this story correctly because I knew there was a right way to tell it, you know. And it took a lot of time and it took a lot of learning about life for the pieces to finally come together. But I got to a point a couple of years ago when it just uh, finally clicked and I knew it had to be a book. It had to be as accurate to history as I could make it. And it had to be about the ambiguous truth because what you get when you do research about Elizabeth Bathory more than anything is the myth. You get the stories of her bathing in virgin's blood. You get the stories of her torturing and killing hundreds of young girls. Mm -hmm. You get uh, the idea that she um, covered herself in blood to maintain eternal youth. Um, and these are great myths. They are great fantasy fodder. But they, of course, well, not of course, but they might not be true. They're definitely exaggerated. They're definitely they exaggerated, right? And so what I started doing is I started doing research into the real woman. And her story, Elizabeth Bathory's story, is just as fascinating as the crazy myths that have been spun um, through the centuries. So my book is... It is going to be touching on a lot of those, obviously, because you can't ignore them. And some of them are based in reality. There really was a trial. Uh, she really was imprisoned for these murders. She died um, blocked up in her castle. Um, but there is so much more at play that is so fascinating to me. There's politics, there's religion, there's um, psychology, uh, psychopathy that it goes into this story. Um, and it's it's been just my mission for the past couple of years to figure out the best way to tell that story. 
So I mean, what you mentioned, the the accounts I've read about her has murders in the hundreds. And of she's course, yes. Murders. So what is the... Very exaggerated. That number you'll find in the Guinness Book of World Records is 650. <laughs> that is the... That is, uh, that is literally a woman testified that she heard a guy saw it in a book that may have been her Elizabeth Bathory's. So it is very much like I heard a guy say, I heard a guy say. Um, <laughs> That's a really, I heard a person tell yeah, me. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> he said, she said very much so. And um, the real number was probably between 100 and 150. So still a very large number. That's a lot of bodies. That's, That's a lot it of is a lot of bodies. But the when you read the trial documents, the 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 four people who were her main accomplices, they all give different numbers. So everybody had a different version of her in their head. Everybody saw her as something different, and that's something that really fascinates me. They have different numbers, but I, what were, did they have different accounts for the behavior and why she did and acted out the way she did? They had some, yeah, some said that um, she herself claimed that it was her accomplices that drove her to it. She also claimed that she was being framed by her political enemies. The accomplices have mo- most of their testimony lines up. But here's the problem is that, A, that testimony is hundreds of years old. It was written down by by scribes who were, we don't know how closely accurate those words were taken down. Probably not with the same accuracy as court reporters today. Um, we also know that all of those um, uh, testimonies were gotten via torture because that was common that was how any testimony it was paid or it was tortured out of you so those accounts have a lot that you know you got to take them with grains of salt um everything about her you have to take with a grain of salt and that's what i love i love the fact that you don't even i i'm writing a book about her i don't know anything for sure about this woman and i love that you kind of talked about she has political ambitions in this Very time frame as well. So, so she, oh, she came from one of the most powerful fam- families in Hungary at the time. She owned so much land. I actually, in doing research for this, I went to Europe to to look, to, to kind of walk around the castles that she owned. She owned so many, I had to go to three different countries. Holy so there, like, the Bathory name was synonymous with old power. And she she had uncles who were cardinals, princes, um, the vo- voivodes of of Transylvania, like really important people, and she was kind of cursed by being born a woman. She really wanted, I believe, that she really wanted to achieve a lot more than she did. But because of the era, the best she could hope for was being the wife of somebody powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she, as a very strong and very obstinate, very smart woman, she was incredibly well educated for her time. Um, she bumped heads with a lot of the powerful men. She rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And that kind of, there are a lot of people who think that she was framed completely. I'm not among them, but there is a lot of, of evidence there that, that pressure was pushed to imprison her. The certain testimonies and evidence that probably present in her trial probably was maybe misinformed or probably not completely it accurate. It could have been, and, and it, a lot of the testimonies could have been persu- like like paid for. Um, yeah, there's there's so much uh, going into this. There's there's a lot of strings that I've been having to unwrap. Okay, honestly, now you're talking about this, Rose. I feel like this is like a really good. You have some really special, <laughs> interesting here. But I'm I'm almost Thank thinking you. like it's like the crucible in a way, like something like Arthur Miller, where you have like a lot of turmoil politically. I don't are, disagree with that that analogy yeah la the what i'm because the main the main thrust of what because here's the thing is that i am telling this story the way that it's going to be formatted non-linear and from multiple perspectives you're getting her perspective but you're also getting the the main man who brought her down you're getting the perspective of her children you're getting the perspective of her husband of the 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 accomplices who were killed and tortured on her behalf you're getting a lot of people's truths and not all of those truths will line up to to each other so what i want when you are done reading this book is the same sense of confusion and frustration and hunger that i have felt researching this story how long is this going you started when you were 16 so i my my interest started when i was 16 the research proper has been two years two years and you of of research and and brainstorming yeah so i've got a lot of way to go did you did how was your family and friends when you told them you're going to hungary and different countries to look at a person who did not want me i would imagine so i went alone for three weeks i went to uh vienna bratislava and budapest and i had a lot of older family members who were like you can't do that 
you can't go alone. And I was like, no, I'm I like you guys raised me to know how to travel. <laughs> and also, I can't not. The castle she was imprisoned in is still standing. I can't not go there if I have the opportunity to. Um, and I did, and it was it was chilling, and it was it, it like amazing, and and the the information I got there was just so cool, and and I think uh, what my family and friends, I think the thing that impresses them most is that I've kept with it for this long. <laughs> Truly, I mean, yeah, and the the fact that I have I've shown no signs of slowing down, which is absolutely true. Like I, what I'm sharing with you right now is one of literally a handful of scenes that I feel ready to share. There is so much more to go. I have a whole book left to write. It's in my head. I promise you, it's in my head. It's just taking a while to get out because I want it to be perfect. <laughs> I've, I've, I always thought of myself I'd be the parent where I would want to push my kids. But on some level, I do keep parents a little, your relatives a little mm. credit here because I'm, I'm going to a foreign country sure. where I don't anything and it's about a notorious serial killer in history. Sure. So I imagine I'd be a little worried about, like, okay, I'll just take... Of course, and their, their worries were founded to some degree, but I I never felt unsafe in those countries. I, yeah. I you know, that was that was a great, a great trip for me, and even the work I did beforehand was incredibly enlightening, so... Um, so yeah, it all worked out. My my parents did not push me into this mm-hmm. in any. They're they're astounded at how far I have taken this because this was not what I was going to do with my life. Mm-hmm. I went to film school. I thought I was going to end up uh, living and working in L.A. and that did not work out. And I ended up kind of like taking this leap into fiction that was not planned. But I can't like it's a it's a train off the tracks now. I just like I got to get this book out. I don't know what I'm doing, but I got to make it happen. You're you possessed know? by it and you just have to exercise and just get it out of your much, system. Yeah, just like, put it on paper. Yeah. This is, she is, she has been, she like, there. Lin-Manuel Miranda, when he was talking about Hamilton, he wrote, he, he talked about how Alexander Hamilton like came out of the grave and shook him and said, tell my story. And I feel like that has been what Elizabeth did to me is that she came from the grave and said, you've got to tell my story. Like these guys are getting it wrong. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to do. I mean, it's someone I, I've heard of many times, but it's not like a huge, she's not a huge figure i think maybe in, in palm culture as, as you would think I, whenever i ask somebody whenever somebody asks me what i'm writing the first question i ask them is have you heard of the blood countess elizabeth bathory it has been about 40 60 40 percent people know and 60 percent people don't know yeah so there are some people who do but not a lot. like i only know because i saw a crappy movie the frankie mutas sure, and so sure. like they talked about that but i would have never found out would have never known about it unless i had that so i mean well, because it's a it's a tragic tale. Like she's not a hero. She's not a great person. Like not, but, she was a, she was a sadist. But there's good material, I think, from a, a writer's perspective. Like this could be used for a good. And there it, have it, been it, books written about it, but they're not that good. Yeah. I I mean I don't need to throw shade at other artists, <laughs> other writers. But I've read the books that have been written about her, ex- with the exception of the the Blood Confessions, which I really do recommend. Um, I have not been impressed with what has been written about her because uh, it has either been basically torture porn or just trying to kind of absolve her of all the crimes. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe in either of those things. Kind of puts her in a positive light. You're saying that either either can... positive or far too negative. And there's there's too much ambiguity in this story that it is juicy and I want to dig into. I really like your book. It sounds like you, you don't want to even have like a, an opinion on her. Like you just have, here's my evidence. Here's what I've taken apart. Correct. Here it is. I don't really want to say what she is. I she really can... don't. I, I have my own beliefs and those are going to inform the story, but they're not beliefs about whether or not she was like, I, I'm not going to pass judgment on her. And I, because it was 600 years ago in another country and we don't have other records, I can't. Mm-hmm. This is all speculative. But isn't it fun? Isn't it fun to wonder? Isn't it fun to to see what could be? Um, and so that's kind of the angle that I'm trying to come at it with. So how far into the book are you with it right now? Where are Writing? I, yes. Um, okay. If 100% is done, I want to say I'm 20% there. I think realistically I have got another two or three years ahead of me. Okay. Um, and that is – that is ide- I, like that's an ideal. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it takes longer, but I like – This is all I'm doing right now. Like, I am lucky enough that I do not have to have another job while I do this. So this is all I'm doing right now. So hopefully that'll speed up the process. Um, But 
Yeah, I don't know. And I wish I could give you a date. I wish I could tell you it'll be in stores next month. I can't. <laughs> I can just say that I am working super hard on this. And, like, I hope there will be people out there who will freaking follow me on Twitter and just, like, get interested, get excited about it with me. And Are you talking on Twitter about this? Like, the findings oh, yeah, you're I'm having, trying into it? I'm yeah. on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Bathory Book. Bathory uh, Book. All, all lowercase. Um, and I'm trying like I don't have a website for it yet I don't have a publisher or anything I just have like this fire in me that's that's going to get this book made Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what's keeping me going mostly that's good what's been reaction like on Twitter do people reach out to you they have questions about it no 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 but it's Twitter like it's it It, it goes to I'm sure like just void it's just people following me so that I'll follow them it's Twitter it's it's garbage like I don't think anybody who is on Twitter really wants to be on Twitter (laughs) but I am there and I am trying because I want because there is a literary community on Twitter and I want people to know about me Mm -hmm. so it's really no. I don't think anybody is interested in me yet on Twitter. Okay. Um, nobody cares what I have to say because I'm a nobody right now. But even, I'm, I'm saying more about the subject and Bathory. People are maybe no, checking just for that. No. No. Okay. Not really. I think I, I have I have like a, a hundred plus followers, and I think they're just following me because I followed them back first because it's other writers in mm. history and horror that I've followed. Um, no, this is you guys are getting the first taste. That's good. So I, I love that. I was going to say in five years' time, because I do a show on Tuesdays for Right on Radio. And I think if that comes, when you do have that book ready, mm-hmm. I'd love to bring you back and talk about that and have a follow up and see where That'd you ended awesome. up and what did you come up with. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Have you found any? If, okay, so people don't have a lot of communication on Twitter, but mm-hmm. have you had, so no one's giving you any findings or any kind of. That would be, no. I think be a good way to find out some more stuff about her. Like, if people have some tidbits that maybe you don't have about Honestly, her. Honestly, and I don't mean to brag here, but I do a little bit. There is nothing, there's no new information that I don't think, that I think anybody could give me right now. I have done, I have dug so deep into this woman's life. I have dug so deep into the political and religious climate of the era that, like, honestly... I would. I just want people to get excited about the book. I don't need like when I first started. I was emailing per- college professors saying like, "Hey, can we can we talk about history? Can we talk about this era? Can we talk about anything? Literally anything related?" Nobody got back to me. And at this point, I don't need to do that anymore because I have become the expert. So. At this point, it's more just like I want to get other people excited. Yeah. I want them to ask me questions because I have the info. Ask me anything. I've got the info, son. <laughs> Do you have any plans now? I mean, you have this information. You're writing the book. Have you yeah. thought about considering maybe doing like a lecture or have some kind of people come around for you? God, can talk that about would this? be awesome. That's a really good I have idea. no That's plans. Really... I, I've like in my in my pipe dreams, I would love to like I could te- I feel like I could teach a class about this era. But like that is not something I'm actively pursuing yet. Because I gotta get the book written first. Okay. That's that's what it's all about is just getting the manuscript ready and sent out and start getting those yummy rejection letters. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost out of time. Well, we got five, a couple of minutes here. So tell me now. So you're doing this work. Anything else? You're, this is 100. percent You're told. This is 100. percent Like okay. um, this is this is what I'm doing. Um, what do you do to tune that out? Do you ever have moments where you just gotta listen? To, like I gotta listen to my Cyrus or just. Just get, my, just get this out of my system I for do, a bit. Like, do you, I do how other do you, things. Okay. Like, I have, I, have a life. I keep That's a balance okay. in my okay. life. Absolutely, but okay. like, this is the main, the the cr- main creative. I, I don't. I do cross stitch. I like. I, <laughs> I have. I'm a. Cra- I'm crafty. I do other crafts. Yeah, like, <laughs> I have other things I do. But in terms of writing, this is my main thing. Okay. Unless you want to try to find my fan fiction, which I will never tell you about. Well, okay. Well, no. So. no, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, but we'll, don't give us a name, but give us a sub. Like, what was your fan fiction? Buff? Was it uh, Sabrina? Oh, no. I haven't gotten into Sabrina. I haven't totally talked about the people. She's also Ever the heard only... of a little show called Lost Girl? Oh, somebody in the studio has. It's a Canadian sci-fi show with Never a bisexual it. lead. <laughs> I write, I, I've written some fan fiction about that. Elena, what's it about? <laughs> hey, hey, Elena. Elena. <sighs> But no, the, like in terms of of major work, this is this is it. This is gonna be my my debut, as they say. Debut. Um, okay. Yeah. Did fan fiction at least help you get an idea of your voice and writing? I I promote fan fiction. At, I think people should write. I think people should read. I think if you 
or a writer who wants to start getting comfortable with writing fan fiction is the best place to start. It is how I cut my teeth as a writer and how I got the first positive feedback of people telling me like, hey, you're good at this. You should keep doing this. And that I, I can't tell you how important that was to me. Like, I've never done fan fiction or never writing in fan fiction, but there was actually a really great Wired article last month talking about how people, this whole generation of kids, when the Internet started, came a big thing in the 90s, they kind of surrounded themselves and came into a world where fan fiction was everything to them and it helped them form friendships. It really and, did. It yeah. really did. And I was one of those people of like there were there were there were TV shows groups where the fandom community would like was was my life when I was a teenager. So yeah, that's absolutely a thing. So support fan fiction. Yeah. Let, let's de shame it. <laughs> <laughs> but also explore different storylines you maybe once seen the shows you wanted to have. Like you exactly. want to see this... like I, I you play they're just dolls to play with. Like yeah. just have fun. Yeah. It's this fringe network where you can play and play with different stuff if you want to see something happen. You're like, well that's way too too risque to have maybe this this character go in this direction or have this relationship with this person, but I can do it with my fan fiction. Exactly. People respond to it. And actually, in many cases, I know I've read people, creators, I think Joss Whedon's even talked about with Buffy, they have fan fiction. He's oh like, my God, there's a whole thing there's about this. There's a whole the, thing. And he even like relented and said, you know what, you fans, you guys had it right. And like, exactly. You, they, 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 the fans, once a, a creator puts content out there, the fans kind of own it. And the, that fan, fan fiction is pretty much proof of that. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having we're me. I talk, really appreciate it. We're talking with Rose Schaffer and her work, Bloody Counts, is hopefully coming out here in a couple of years. Yeah, but please follow me at Bathory Book. I'm ER Schaefer on Twitter if you if you want to check me out. But yeah, get excited. All right. This is the Unhallowed Words, a night of Unhallowed Words. I'm Josh Weber, keeping you in the touch with this horror community around Minneapolis. Stay tuned. And now this.